This video is about answering the question, how good a fit can we find for a dataset? We know how to fit a random variable to a dataset. We just write out the likelihood and find the maximum likelihood estimators for all of the unknown parameters. We could, if we wanted, do this over and over again with many different random variables and see which of them fits best. But is there an end to this process? Is there a way to find the best possible fit? Let's look at a picture. This is the data set of speeds of galaxies, which we looked at in the last video. If we wanted a perfect fit, we could try drawing a very detailed custom PDF to try and match all the ins and outs of the histogram as closely as possible, and then generate a random variable from this PDF. But this is very tricky to get right. What if we've drawn something that isn't even a PDF? A PDF has to integrate to one, and this is hard to enforce when we're just sketching a curve by hand. If I try to make my PDF a bit taller in one place to fit the histogram better, I have to make it smaller everywhere else, and this is very fiddly to do. A much better idea is to draw a custom CDF. Any custom CDF we draw is legitimate as long as it's an increasing function, or to be technical about it, a non-decreasing function, between 0 and 1. So the only question is, once we've got our custom CDF, one which is a very tight fit for the data set, how do we go about generating a random variable from it? Let's work through some examples to build up intuition for the link between custom CDFs and code. We'll start with the simplest possible CDF. If you see this CDF, you should immediately recognize it as a uniform distribution, uniform in the range U to V. The CDF has constant slope in this range from U to V, which means that when you differentiate it, you get a constant, which means the PDF is constant, which means that all values in the range U to V are equally likely, which is a uniform random variable. Okay, so that one you should just learn by heart and be ready to use it at a moment's notice. Next, how would you generate a random variable that has this CDF? This one takes a bit more creative thinking. The way I'd reason about it is this. The graph says that with probability p, we're to generate values to the left of v. So the first thing I'm going to do is make this random choice, either generate something to the left of v or something to the right of v. If I've decided to generate something on the left, then all values between u and v are equally likely because the CDF has constant slope. So I'll simply generate a uniform random variable. Likewise, if I've decided to generate something on the right, I'll generate a different uniform. It's worth staring at this for a while. I've talked about why the CDF on the left translates to the code on the right. But you should also spend some time thinking about it the other way. If someone gave you the code on the right, could you derive its CDF using the methods that we learned way back in section 1.5? Okay, once you're happy, Let's go on to the next example. Here's another CDF. Let's break it down in the same way. First, decide if we want to be on the left part or the right part. The CDF tells me that the probability of each is a half, so it's just a simple call to np.random.choice. I don't even need to specify the probabilities. Then, just as before, I choose a uniform vari random variable to generate with parameters based on which side I'm on. The flat bit between u2 and v1 doesn't matter. If the CDF is flat, then the PDF, i.e. the derivative of the CDF, is equal to zero, so we don't want to generate any values in that range. OK, here's another one. This one's exactly the same as before, just with different variable names. Here, the two uniforms are very narrow. There's a uniform of x1 minus delta to x1 plus delta, and another one for a small band around x2, but exactly the same code as before. Now, let's take it to the extreme. Let's let delta go to zero, giving us a step function. If we take just the same code as before and ask what happens when delta is set to zero, it's easy either return x1 or x2. Well, 
actually, this is a daft way to write the code. All this code does is return x1 with probability a half, return x2 with probability a half, and we can write it much more simply, np.random.choice of x1, x2. This returns just one of them, chosen at random, each equally likely. Clearly, this generalizes each straightforwardly to lists of arbitrary length. Here, if x it, with an arrow on top is a list of data points and we pick an item at random from the list, the CDF is just this step function. Let's write that out formally. Let x star be the random variable obtained by choosing a value at random from the list. The CDF of this random variable is given by this formula here. You should recognize this formula. It's what we had in the last video. It's nothing other than the empirical cumulative distribution function for a data set. In other words, we've got a random variable which is a perfect match for the data set's empirical cumulative distribution function. So this answers the question we asked at the beginning of the video, how good a fit can we find for the data set? The answer is, we can find an absolutely perfect 100% spot on fit. And we don't need to know any standard random variables or any probability modeling. We don't even need to know maximum likelihood estimation to find this fit. This should make you stop and think, what on earth were we doing for the first half of this course, fitting probability models left, right and center, when the perfect fit is staring us in the face and doesn't need any maths at all? Sometimes PhD supervisors used to send their students to me to help them out with modeling work. I often heard the question, Dr. Wishick, here's my data set. What distribution should I use to model it? And I told the students, use the distribution of the data set. Sometimes they went away enlightened. Sometimes they went away and asked a friend who told them, hey, here's a clever Gumbel distribution or a logistic distribution or exponential or whatever, and here's some code to fit it. And that answer made them happy. But what that means is that they hadn't thought hard enough about the question they actually wanted answered. We're halfway to enlightenment here. In the next video, I'm going to wrap up this discussion of empirical distributions and show you how it links to several of the other ideas we've seen in this course.